So with that note, I think we'll just get started here. I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Cooper to our program tonight. Uh, he's earned his PhD from the University of Miami in Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Sciences. Uh, though he has proven to be rather multidisciplinary, he describes himself fundamentally as an environmental chemist. He is now technically retired professor emeritus from UC Irvine and has a graduate appointment in environmental and engineering sciences here at UF. He moved to Florida from Irvine, California in 2017 and lives out by Little Lake, Santa Fe. He, has to, he will tell you that he's officially flunked retirement and one of his distractions is nature photography, uh, which is what brings him here tonight. He's going to regale us with a slideshow of birds he's photographed in Costa Rica. And if we're lucky, we'll get some, some good um, study photography of the white collared mannequin, which are, I, I got a preview last night and just like all the other mannequins are fascinating birds, uh, mating behaviors, remarkable. Uh, he's also your go-to guy for butterfly photography. So if anybody belongs to a related society and needs a speaker, he's your guy. Uh, I posted links in the chat to his YouTube channel, his Instagram and his, uh, his, his beautiful book on uh, butterflies from the Iguazu Falls in Argentina. And I posted links to all those in the chat. He describes the book as just a coffee table book. So um, it is pretty remarkable if you ask me. Uh, and with that note, I'll just pass it on to him. All right, let's see if we can get going here now, Michael. That's the next big thing. <laughs> we did practice. We did. So go ahead and you can share your screen and I'll see if I can get my. I'm not sure it wants to open up. I need to. Oh, I guess oh, I've got to share my screen. There we go. Yeah. Now let me see. Oh, I guess I guess I got to bring my my thing over here. Last night, we didn't have any trouble. <laughs> yeah, our practice went smoothly. <laughs> this is going smoothly, too. Oh, there you go. All right. Now, so what you should see is just a black thing here. This is going to be an introduction to the birds of uh, Purella Ecological Garden, which is north and just a little bit east of San, uh, San Jose. That's over the mountains. Can everybody see that pretty well? Yeah, yep, that's showing up fine. Scarlet macaws used to be very common around the Purella area, but then the uh, Purella Garden, but then they got hunted away. They've used them, collect them for sending them off for pets at homes. Could we make it full screen? Yeah, it's it's as full for me as I can get. Um, how much? How? Okay. 
anything next year. I guess that's about it. On the volume bar there, there, there are two little buttons on the right side. Would one of those maximize it? How small is it? Oh, it, it's most of the screen. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's 95% of the screen, so. Yeah. So that's your white collared, white necked jacket in there. On the right, that's a rufous-tailed hummingbird. This is the littlest, littlest of the four. We have four species of hummingbirds down there. That's the biggest one. He's looking for snakes. They're a snake eating falcon.
You can see that the chick is actually larger than the adult, which is not uncommon in birds. 
And when the chick is interested in being fed, it will flap its wings like this, and then the adult will feed it. So I wake up in the morning.
that noise is it's raining out. That's why it's so noisy. That's it. Okay. Now we'll do a quick one here that's just a minute long on the uh, the 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 Jacobins. If I can get it to whoop there for me. Maybe I just have to click it twice. There we go. Okay, let me expand it. This is a very interesting story about the 
white necked Jacobin. I can't get it any bigger than that, I'm sorry. This video is about a behavior which we did not expect for the white necked Jacobin hummingbird. After the hummingbirds had mated and the female laid the eggs, it was up to the male to actually incubate the eggs and complete the construction of the nest. And you'll see that in this and in the following video. The interesting thing about this, what I thought was a male Jacobin, this is actually a female dressed up as a male. And uh, I talked to, I, I got in touch with the people. Well, there was a story in Living Bird from the Cornell Bird Lab. And Jay Falk did his PhD work on the Jacobins down in um, uh, Panama. And it turns out that one in five uh, females uh, actually dresses up as a as a as a male, and they think it's just to make it easier for her to get to to be more competitive at the foods. Uh, now, if how's everybody doing? You want to see the last one on the mannequin? This is a uh, about a twelve or thirteen minute. This is the just about the life cycle of a mannequin. This is the white collared mannequin, Manicus candi. Now I'm going to slow it down so you can actually watch the mating. There's the male. There's the female. Once the mating has been completed, the female flies off to locate an area for a nest. She first builds a nest, then she lays her eggs, and then she raises the chicks without any help from the male until they fledge.
The white collared mannequin is a seed eating species of birds. It seems apparent from this video that as the chicks are very young, she brings smaller seeds. And then as they age, she will bring larger seeds for the chicks to feed on. For much of this video, you can actually hear the poison dart frog referred to as blue jeans in the background. They're very common at Kerala, and you'll hear it most of the time. The female in this case apparently decided that the chick had had enough to eat and nestled down on the top of the chick, even though the chick was still begging. In the background, you can hear the clay colored thrush singing its song. It's the Costa Rican national bird it was named the national bird of Costa Rica because of its melodious song that it sings. And it, from about April till August, it sings it almost nonstop. We had been watching this female and the chick uh, on a daily basis because it was very close to a main trail between uh, the dining area and the living quarters. And then disaster struck. Crystal and I were going to see the nest, and when we got close, we could see that the nest had been destroyed. Luckily, Crystal, with her sharp eyes, looked down on the ground and saw the chick. She very gently picked it up, and we hurried back to the dining area, where we fed it the only thing we had, and that was sugar water. At first, it didn't like the sugar water, but then eventually it actually was eating it for some nourishment. Crystal then made a little nest out of a box and she slept with it overnight. The next day, William suggested that we put this baby in another nest where he had seen only one egg. We did that and as unbelievable as it may seem, the mother immediately adopted it. In the next part of this video for a little while is what happened with our little chick and the, uh, the new parent. You can see this female has brought back to the chick relatively large seeds. And as one goes down the chick's throat, another one comes up from the pouch just under the beak of the female uh, and that is ready to be fed to the chick. Finally, after some days in the new nest, we actually saw the chick appear with the adult in the nest. Unfortunately, I didn't keep a time track, so I don't know how many days it's been since we first saw this baby chick in the other nest. But you can see that already it has got well-developed wings and with little feathers, and it is looking more like a bird. And I would put that in quotes. Uh, than uh, before.
Only a mother could love a baby that looks like this baby. Beauty, as we know, is in the eyes of the beholder. Here is some rather interesting behavior by the female where she actually catches or tries to catch the baby's seed that he's excreting. And it looks very much like the seed that comes out is similar to the seed that goes in. As the female nestles down on top of the chick, it seems as though the chick pushes a seed up on the side and the mother then eats the seed. As I mentioned earlier, the white collared mannequin is primarily a seed eater. However, if the female can indeed catch an insect, they will feed that to the chick. In this case, the female looks to have caught a damselfly which she feeds to the chick, which is then followed immediately by a large seed. During the course of this video, you may have seen the chick excreting seeds that look very similar to the seeds that went in its mouth. In this case, the female actually catches the seed and then eats it. I'm not sure what happened to that seed, whether she just continues to digest it in her own body or if she then refeeds it to the, to the chick. But at any rate, um, she, is, she does catch it and then reuses it in some way. You can see in this portion of the video, when the female leaves the nest, the chick really sinks down into the nest so as to not be obvious to potential predators. That was the last video clip that I took of our chick being fed by the adult because I had to leave Costa Rica. Once the chicks have fled, then it is necessary for them to start with the next phase of their lives. And one of the most important aspects for the males is practicing the courtship dance. The males tend to get together in groups and can practice either by themselves or with a whole group of males at a specific location. Notice that this court is not nearly as clean as the court of a mature male. And also the clicking that the immatures make with their wings is not nearly as crisp as that of the older mature males. All right, that's it for the night. Great, that was, that was excellent. The uh, mannequins, I only know mannequins from documentaries, but uh, they've been one of my favorite birds for a long time. So that was yeah. great. They're, they're so frenetic. There's about 40, 54 species of mannequins. And uh, 
they're called the Michael Jackson bird because some of them actually dance yeah. along the side of the of the the branch. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. There there are a couple more species in Costa Rica, but down here the white collared is the most prominent. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I, I have a few. We also have um, Emily Schwartz has asked a question in the chat. Uh, did you record these birds for a scientific research project or just for your own pleasure? Uh, actually, my own pleasure. <laughs> I've got about, uh, well, I don't know exactly how many terabytes I have. I have, I think, around 15 or 20 terabytes of white colored mannequin film. Because when I collected it all together on my three external hard drives, I've got three external hard drives here, which have a to total of 72 terabytes. It took me 18 hours to to transfer it from one oh. <laughs> from one file to the next. <laughs> were, were you in Costa Rica specifically to see the birds, or were you there for another reason? I actually started to go down there uh, to Pirella because it's a butterfly garden, and because of my interest in butterfly photography, uh, I wanted to go down there and shoot the butterflies. But when I got down there, I realized that the birds are are unbelievable, and you could hear. The people in the dining hall, a lot of those birds are, are right next to where, where you eat. So you can have, actually eat and then see all those birds. Uh, but there's, uh, well, I don't know how many different species of birds, but this is just a, just a, a smattering of, of the yeah. amount of birds. But uh, we raise about 20, well, he's just now expanded. He's probably got a license to raise up to 50 species of butterflies. So the one on my, uh, you said you did put my uh, my YouTube channel in the in the chat. I did, yeah. Yeah, the the one that's attracted the most attention is the life cycle of the blue morpho butterfly. It's been seen by over fifteen thousand people. So it's fascinating. I know there's I, the UF sources, but their their cocoons from uh, from Costa Rica for their. Uh... They do, but not from not from Pirella. There's another place out uh, on the western side that they get their uh, their, cocoon, their uh, pupae from. Yeah, yeah. Ian Ian points out in the chat there's 69 new species under the license. Okay. So, so um, not Ian, not Ian, Bill. I'm I'm in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds like it sounds like Kevin. It is. <laughs> So it, uh, did you travel for most of your photography or? Um, that was, you... all of that photography was right at the Purella Ecological Garden, which is three hectares, seven and a half acres. In 1995, William started, uh, he, he was working for another, I'm not sure it was a conservation group or whatever, but he found out that he could make money by raising blue morphos. So he started with a, a 20 by 20 meter cage for blue morphos. And as he sold the blue morphos to the Costa Rican entomological supply, he then would buy more and more acreage. So he's now up to uh, the three hectares. And one of the things that Kevin was just on, what we've got, we've got an NGO that we're putting together that we're hoping to be able to raise money to buy land in Costa Rica. And we, the idea is we want to buy pasture land and convert it into secondary rainforest. Um, so that for capture, uh, carbon capture, actually. That's the, well, carbon capture is one thing, but, but it also increases the, the, the biodiversity uh, and, and, it, and you have ecosystem services and then wildlife um, corridors as well. So all of that is looking at sustainability and at the same time capturing carbon uh, out of the atmosphere. That was, uh, I, I figured you probably couldn't be traveling too far because uh, the shocking number of those pictures are pictures of birds eating bananas. <laughs> right, that's right. That's right, exactly where, where we where we eat too. You turn around and, and that and you you could hear the the probably Cristal and her sister or or somebody else there actually cooking while we were there. So they cook on a wood stove and uh, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's, uh, up to, they, I mean they're all phenomenal. But what really stood out to me was a Baltimore Oreo eating a banana. So yeah, I have to put some bananas out for my Oreos. I've been <laughs> feeding them jam and. Uh, and oranges. I think bananas would be cheaper. Yeah, and, and it, like in the, you know, when they get good and ripe, that's when they like them. And that's also will bring in, of course, it won't up, up here, but it, down there, that's what the blue morphos eat too, is, is really rotten bananas. Because they have no, just with the proboscis, they have no way of getting them. Um, although Emily the other day showed pictures of um, some butterflies, heliconius, that actually have um, 
pollen on their beaks and, or on their proboscis. And we were talking about that this morning, actually. Um, and, and she said that they think what happens is that there are certain digestive enzymes that actually break apart the pollen and then the inside of the pollen then can, can be ingested by the butterfly. And it's in the group of heliconias, butterflies, heliconians. Well, if you, uh, if you ever do your butterfly talk, let us know here at the Audubon Society. I'm sure we can get, a, get attendees because I, I, would, I would love to, uh, to, to be part of that. I, well, I wouldn't want to host it, but I'd love to watch it. <laughs> well, you can host it and you can watch it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's... <laughs> well, we can, it, the Audubon probably, Society is all about, all about uh, wildlife and, uh, and naturalism. So I guess we could, we could probably wing a butterfly talk right. as well. I yeah, agree. Well, I agree. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I have I have right now about twenty five thousand pictures of butterflies of Iguazu Falls, and I have them broken all the way down into the six different families. So I usually never get past the nymphalidae because there's so many of them. So well, yeah. Do do let us know when you get that ready. I'm sure Emily, our Emily, will be uh, more than happy to get that set up. Well, whenever whenever you got an opening, it takes about as much. To get that ready as this one does that they're all they're all i just have to find it back it those are actually slides i do have some videos of, of the butterflies but most of those are slides i'm up to uh around 210 or 220 different species of butterflies wow. now that i've gotten down at iguazu when i was at the national science foundation up in washington I also gave that talk to the Entomological Society of Washington, which then I, I then they gave me access to the, uh, the the museum's collection, which is the second largest collection of butterflies in the world. It's uh, actually it's it's uh, nine no five million uh, specimens. I think, I think I see my cousin Nancy up there. Yes, you do. <laughs> Bringing all the family out. <laughs> uh, she's from yeah. Nancy and Don live in New Jersey. So there's Don. <laughs> well, there he is. Sneak hey, Don. in, Don. <laughs> and um, we have one more question from Jennifer Donley asked, has a question for us. Uh, do yeah. you have cameras pointed specifically at nests at Prella? Or do you, was this all you traveling? No, I actually go find the nests. In fact, my, my camera um, it, it is, this is, I don't know if you can see this. Yep. So this is a this is a 4K camera. Can you see that? We can, yeah. Yep. Okay, it's a 4K camera, and then I have a series of lenses on it. Um, this one is is I think it's a zoom a 35 to 100 is what I use, but I have a, a 100 to 400 too for some of those um, woodpeckers in 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 the pileated. Well, it's called the lineated down there woodpecker. Um, those I used use my 400. So yeah, so I have a series. And the reason I bought this, well, not only is it because it's a 4K, um, but I also bought it because then all of those uh, lenses fit onto my EOS 5. They're all the same same lens. Yeah, so once, once you get into a, a, a line of a brand of camera, you're kind of stuck there once you start spending money on lenses. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's the lenses that are, that are the, the expensive part. It's the question had been... And yeah. The question had been generated by I did a I helped with a study many years ago on a bower bird and we had video yeah. that was from um, motion activated cameras so we could watch the bowers as the male was displaying and yeah. it was very obvious from the sounds that all of the successful mates mating events were in the dark because every last one that we saw the male would make his move and she would take off take off <laughs> <laughs> she just did um, like. Yeah, it's interesting. What's well, interesting, like with the with the white collared mannequin, um, that whole display a lot of times doesn't end up. The female decides that 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 the guy isn't really a good enough dancer, so she just flies off. But I just happened to be there when they actually made it, and, and I think I saw that another time. But it's it's such a wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. That, that you really have to have your your eyes on there, and that's why I had to slow that down to ten percent of the speed just so you could. To, to get an idea of it, but it's 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 an amazing thing. So what I do is I go out and look for this. Now, there, uh, the, the, the one exception is when I do sloths because they don't move very fast. This last time I was down there and got a, a three-toed sloth with her baby and she was 
uh, teach the baby was learning how to walk, well, actually to hang. So we got these beautiful, beautiful little pictures of the baby just sitting on mom's chest like this. And then he went around, he or she went around and then looked at us upside down and stuff like this. It was just amazing. I just, I've got that all made, but I need to want to put some music to it. So I haven't. <laughs> So Bill, Bill, when I go down there this time, I'll be bringing an intervalometer and uh, some trail cameras as well. So hopefully we'll oh, be able to get some, get some, but it won't be the quality of your giant 4K machine there, but hopefully we'll be able to get some stuff uh, yeah. without having to man it. Well, and so this is Kevin Donnelly, everybody. So he's the, he's the CEO of the, of the, the, the uh, NGO that we're putting together. And when, when he was down last time, he and William were out, I was with, Crystal at a different part, but they actually saw an ocelot down there, and Kevin got a picture of the ocelot's eyes. <laughs> That's about all you could see, but it, <laughs> but it was an ocelot. And and the next night they saw it. Or the next day they saw it. It was on on a, on a tree, just relaxing in, in, at night. So that was the first time I think William had seen an ocelot there. And that scarlet macaw. There used to be a lot of scarlet macaws around there, but they've been in that particular area of Costa Rica. They've been killed off for or trapped for to to, uh, to actually for to get babies and then to, to use them for pets. So are there any other questions, Michael? Well, there's no other questions in the chat, but if anybody uh, would like to unmute themselves and uh, ask questions, we're in the informal portion of our program tonight. <laughs> yeah, when, when I was in uh, Costa Rica with watching the the macaw stick its head out of its nest. A family, local family, people from uh, Costa Rica came by and said, would you like to see a snake? Well, my other fellow and I went running down. It was an eyelash viper. And we got some great, great photos of the, of the protruding uh, sections above the eye that it's called the eyelash. But they're, sm they're pretty small. They're like the well, they're size tiny. Yeah. Like the size of a pencil, right? As far as, as, yeah, far this, as was, this was only about 18 inches in length, I think. Yeah. Coiled up on a branch, and the guide would pick it up and let everybody take photographs of it. It was fantastic. Yeah. Well, we've seen some fair lance down there. It could yeah. help. You can see them. You can have them. Well, yeah, I've only seen them dead. So, <laughs> yeah, those are good from a distance. Those are good from a distance. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so now I now I have to key up my I have to figure out where my my butterfly stuff is, but we can we can do that actually with no problem. Maybe sometime in the spring, if you've got an opening, we can do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure um, Emily's no longer with us. Oh, I guess she's with us. Yeah, there she is, still in the chat. But um, yeah, well, uh, I'm sure she'll get in touch with you. I, I, I personally would vote for it. So okay, I don't I don't carry a whole lot of weight here, but I am the narrator, so that's something. <laughs> Well, actually, when I was in Frederick, Maryland, I gave a talk to an Audubon Society on the, the butterflies up there when I was at Fort Detrick in Maryland. And then as a result of that, two of the guys from the Maryland Entomological Society said, hey, now you got to come down and give us that talk. So I did. And now and then I moved away from Maryland. But then when I went back with NSF, I, I joined the Maryland Entomological Society and the, and the Entomological Society of Washington, both of them. So I gave those, I gave the butterfly talk to those people and they, they love it. Yeah. But bird, bird people like butter, butterflies too. Yeah, too. exactly. There, there are, we have quite a number of entomologists in the Audubon Society as well. We're very involved in birding and right. um, they're the ones who are usually looking at the ground where everybody else is looking up at the birds. But That's right. Well, I mean, you know, at UF, we've got one of the best entomology groups in the United States and certainly the butterfly group at, at uh, UF is one of the best. And they probably got, I think it's probably second in the United States, as far as collections go, only to the Smithsonian. They've got a mm -hmm. tremendous, and they got a beautiful butterfly house here, where they get most of the butterflies from Costa Rica. So, including the blue morpho, including the blue morpho, yeah, and it's the Pallades, which is the species that we get uh, with Bill Williams. Because there's a there's a whole bunch of different blue morphos actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an article that I read about the blue morphos in South America. There's quite a few that are. Uh, blue morphos. So, well, save some of that for your talk. Yeah, well, we, can, we can do that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're winding down now. Here, I've, I've right. uh, shut off the recording. Good. I probably.